Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Santa Barbara Community Church. Would you please stand with us? We're a little lighter this morning because a lot of our body is out at the retreat. So let's sing extra loud as we worship together this morning. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love. Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, who oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior, this church opens wide her arms with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, the friend of sinners. Welcome. My name is Karen Robertson, and I have the honor of reminding us of the great privilege we have of gathering together to worship God. Let's take a moment in silence to reflect on that, as well as to ask God to clear our hearts and our minds of all the things that distract us.
Father, thank you that we can come here together to worship you. We do ask that you would clear our minds of things that distract us, clear our hearts of the things that we put in as idols. Teach us the lessons that you want us to learn today from your word and help us to worship you in spirit and truth. Amen.
have a seat. Good morning. Can we get the lights on? Thank you. Whoops, there we go. Let's get them all the way up here so I can see over there we go. Oh, you look great this morning. Welcome. Well, it's good to see your faces. We've, as uh, Matt already said, we've got a few hundred of our people down at retreat in Malibu Canyon. That's why we're a little less this morning, uh, people here. But it's been a great time. Larry and I came back uh, late last night, and uh, I, I w- was remembering a picture we took of our kids when they were in early elementary school, and we drove up into the driveway on Sunday from the retreat, and they were just like passed out and gassed. And I kind of feel like that this morning. <laughs> I'm a little tired, but it's good to be here. Um, that we have so many memories as a church of this place we're retreating down in Malibu Canyon. And just I remember as I just pull in there every year of how God has met his people at this particular place. And I wanted us to, to have a quick time of sharing this morning. And I want you to think about this question When's a time and a place where you felt God present or near or working um, in a maybe a, a more tangible way than than normal? Uh, maybe it was at a maybe it was when you were at a camp or a retreat, or maybe it was in a time of, of worship like this, or maybe it was when you heard somebody teach the gospel and you thought, "Wow, that." God is just speaking to me right now. But I wonder if several of you would be willing to just stand up and give testimony to a time and a place when God is at work. We don't have time for you to tell a long story. But just, I'm going to put this down. Uh, If you would stand where you are, if you can share uh, your name, and just in a few sentences, a time where you remember God being near, present, or working in your life. Would several of you do that? Thanks. Praise God. Ralph.
they had a chapel at an amusement park. That's pretty cool. Yeah. How about somebody who's 30 or less? I want some of our young, a young person to stand up and testify how God has met you. Yes. Well, I didn't know we were going to have this pleasure this morning, but I want to invite Pastor Juma up. Uh, most of you know that the sports outreach uh, ministry is a, a part of one of our missions partners that we love. We have been a, a partner with them for a long time in the work that they're doing in Africa. Come on up here, Juma. And uh, would you welcome Pastor Juma from Kenya? Yeah. There you go. And... They had their board meeting here this week, and so some of them came from Africa and others from different parts of the states, and we're, I, I didn't know you were going to be here this morning, but I'm so grateful, and uh, he's doing some amazing work in Nairobi, Kenya, in the slums there, and, uh, and would you give testimony a little bit to what you've seen God doing at work, how he's transforming lives? Amen. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I've, I've heard of Santa Barbara Community Church for a long time. And uh, I know we have, we have uh, been working together. And uh, I thank God for that. And uh, uh, when he asked me, I was just thinking of the goodness of God uh, upon our lives. You know, Many a times as you serve among the community in the slums, uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's hard. It, it needs the, the grace of God. And I was just thinking of what the, the beauty of God and, and, and the grace that has been sufficient. And please allow me just from the word of God, I, I would want to just give my testimony from there. Uh, Luke chapter 5. This is a story that I know we know. Uh, it's a story. Uh, let me just read uh, from verse 1 and uh, down to verse 5 briefly. Yeah. Now it happens that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had got, gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little away from the land. And he, he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep waters and let down your nets for a catch. Now from this scripture, I just want to thank God because before I came in to the US, I had a moment with uh, some of the children that I, in our sponsorship program, uh, majority of them joined the program of sports outreach when they were tiny boys and girls in the kindergarten. And as I was coming, I was actually uh, with them as they were going to the university. Some were going for their second year. And then I remembered that uh, the Lord has been good. We have been like, like the boat uh, where sometimes you don't know even what to say to somebody. You don't know how to encourage somebody. But like, a bo like the boat of Simon Peter, we allowed Christ just to step into us and be able to use us for his own glory. And you realize that uh, Simon Peter and the team, 
toil through the night. I can equate this to emotions. Uh, sometimes you feel tired. Sometimes even you don't know how to encourage somebody. Sometimes even uh, uh, whatever is around you is overwhelming. But the Lord uh, always encourages us that we just need to, just like, like Simon did, you just allow the Lord to step into your life. You just allow the leading of the Lord. And now, the relevance of this story, uh, it, as I was coming in, we saw helpless uh, children that came into our program. Some were coming just for, for the feeding program. Some were just coming because they wanted to be part of the soccer program or they wanted to be part, part of a program that was running. And you don't know how you will walk with them. But when, you look, when I looked back and I saw the helpless little boys and girls are now getting into the university. Some are going to study to be IT specialist. And I was like, thanking God. So many a times you might not even know, but if we allow Christ to get into our situation, our lives, then he has the power. I want to tell you that Simon Peter could not believe that the same lake they have toiled through all the night, they were able to catch fish from there. But when the Lord said, now cast your net into the deep, he was even doubting. He said that, but Lord, we have been toiling here throughout the night. How is it possible? But when he obeyed, when he allowed the word of God to take over and lead him, then there was a bumper catch of fish. And that, that's my encouragement to us. Many a times you will not know even the step you are making, whether it will bear fruit. But we just need to trust the Lord and allow God into our lives. And when we allow him, then we will see the transformation. And my point is, the transformation, when I see in my mind, the young boys and girls who are helpless, and now they are coming in to get maybe their checks, to go to, to the university. To me, that was a point of Christ encouraging us and working in our lives. And before I hand over, I just want to thank you. <laughs> thank you, Santa Barbara Community Church, for always standing with the Kenyan ministry and Sport, uh, sports outreach work all over, and we are so grateful. When I joined sports outreach, uh, the reports I first found were the reports of Santa Barbara Community Church, for, and I was wondering, what a blessing. And today, the Lord has allowed me to, to worship with you. Thank you so much. The Lord bless you. And receive greetings from, from sports outreach Kenya and the team working over there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your courage, your steadfastness, your faithfulness to God. We're going to pray for you, but uh, I'll take the mic. And thank you again for being with us. Yeah, let's thank him one more time. I'm just humbled, humbled that we have you with us. He's doing good work in a really hard place. Thank you. Let's pray together. Oh, our gracious and loving God, our powerful God. Truly, Lord, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the sovereign God, the Holy One of Israel. You are high and lifted up, and you are also... Emmanuel, God with us, you're tender, you're intimately engaged with this world that you made with love. And we want to praise you, God, for the ways that you've made yourself known to us, for the examples that were shared around this room this morning of the ways that uh, you've been working among us for the fact that you've been working down at the retreat this weekend on people's hearts. Thank you, God. Thank you for what you're doing through sports outreach in Nairobi and in Uganda. Um, 
and for that matter in Mexico and El Salvador, we bless you, God, for the privilege of standing beside these dear ones who are bringing the gospel to uh, weak and helpless children, providing food for their stomachs and spiritual food for their minds and their hearts. Lord, would you continue to bless them, stir them up. Lord, give Pastor Juma and his team uh, all that they need to continue to labor well in your field. And we thank you, God, for making yourself known to us, not just in specific instances and places that we look back on, but most importantly, for making yourself known to us in the person of Jesus Christ through his life, death, and resurrection, and through the written testimony to Christ in the scriptures. Lord, we want to thank you that uh, for all that we know is true about God because we have seen uh, the face of the Father in the person of Christ. We thank you for what Christ has shown us about you, Lord, that you're kind and patient and just and long-suffering, that you're both humble and glorious. We give you praise this morning. And we want to ask you, Lord, we want to pray for those who are desperate for a glimpse of your presence this morning, for those who feel alone and need to know your nearness and tenderness, for those who are hurting and in need of your consolation and touch. Lord, we, we want to lift to you again our, our sister Roberta Myers, who not only lost her husband, Dale, but a few days later lost her brother, Danny. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Be near to her. We pray for Jonathan Mitchell, who, uh, whose mom is critically ill in Texas, and ask that you'd be gracious to her and to the whole family. We lift before you Meryl Dick, who has two brothers right now who are uh, both very ill. And we ask that you'd have your mercy on that family. We continue to lift to you Jack and Taylor Kiefer and their, their infant son, Jude, who's been down at uh, L.A. Hospital for Children for, for months now. And Lord, we pray your mercy. Bring them back to us, Lord. Lord, for those among us who are struggling with sin, uh, we know you always provide a way out of temptation. And we ask that you'd give clarity in the midst of temptation and strength to live for you wholeheartedly. We pray for those who are grieving, that you'd bring comfort. For those who are discouraged, that you'd bring hope. For those who are spiritually sleepy, that you'd wake them up, Lord. Make us aware of how great a privilege it is to live and serve you. For those who are suffering in the wake of Hurricane Fiona, especially those in Puerto Rico, oh God, have mercy on them. And for those in the path of the upcoming Storm Ian in Cuba and Florida, oh God, we, would you guard lives there. And we keep praying uh, for this war in Ukraine, and Lord, many are fearing escalation as more Russian troops have been called up, and the threat of using nuclear weapons has been alluded to, and Lord, we're praying in faith that you would bring an end to this conflict, that you would heal the broken and the brokenhearted, that you would give wisdom to p people in positions of influence, uh, make them peacemakers, and we, we pray over all of this that you would bind the power of the evil one. Lastly, Lord, we want to pray for ourselves as we prepare to hear the preaching of your word. We pray for your servant, David, who's going to come and open the, the scriptures to us. Lord, we ask that we would hear uh, the good news of Jesus afresh this morning. Lord, would you convict us of our sin and bring fresh awareness of your love for us. We pray that you would cast out apathy and fear in this place and that you would embolden us anew to serve you. For you are worthy of all of our devotion, all of our loyalty, all of our praise, all of our thanksgiving. And so we commit ourselves to you again today, Lord. And we ask all of these requests and prayers in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 
you know, because it's retreat weekend, I think we should take a retreat from announcements. How about you? Should we just not have announcements this morning? Let's, uh, let's just take a break. As David's making his way up, why don't you uh, stand and greet the people around you? Let's make sure everyone feels welcome. I don't know. All right, have a seat if you would. I just wanted to introduce briefly my friend David, and he's going to be preaching the word to us this morning. You guys have been in part of the church for... About a year and a half. About a year and a half. Yeah. And uh, as he's going to tell you, he's been a pastor for many years. He, we lead home group together now, which has been awesome. Yeah. And uh, so, David Stoker. Great. Uh, thank you for opening thank the you, Mike. to us. I appreciate the inv- uh, introduction. A few of you probably are asking, who is David Stoker? I usually sit down right there most Sunday mornings uh, at the early service with my wife, Monica. And I tell you, it feels a lot different being up here than it is being down there. Uh, As Mike mentioned, we moved to Santa Barbara about two years ago, and I retired uh, from being a Presbyterian pastor after 40 years. Uh, Monica has a Christian counseling practice located on State Street in downtown Santa Barbara. And um, I um, helped my son Andrew and his wife Shana, and Andrew's a Westmont graduate, uh, provide care for our um, two-and-a-half-year-old grandson Dean and our 12-week-old granddaughter Rosie. And uh, please forgive me for showing you photos of my grandchildren. Someone once said to Sir Winston Churchill, have I told you about my grandchildren? And Winston Churchill said, no, you haven't, and I'm very grateful for that. (laughs) Well, at our church, Monica and I serve as greeters uh, once a month. We, as Mike mentioned, we lead a home group every Wednesday night. And I would encourage you to get in a home group if you haven't. Uh, And I also serve on the Compassion Visitation Team. And this morning, it is my sacred privilege uh, to preach. There was a substitute pastor who was preaching much like I am this morning at a a church that had two worship services. And between the two worship services, the uh, pastor was out on the patio, just like I will be after this service, drinking some coffee. And this uh, guy walked up to him, and he said, Pastor, that sermon really stunk. And the pastor was trying to be open, and he said, well, what didn't you like about it? And the man said, well, first of all, you read it. Secondly, you didn't read it very well. And third, it wasn't worth reading in the first place. (laughs) And after that, the man walked away. Another man came up to him and said to the pastor, oh, don't listen to old Jim. He just repeats what he hears everybody else say. Well, when I come to the platform on a morning like today, I ask myself, what is the one message that God would have me give to you today? Years ago, I was attending a pastor's conference at um, 
uh, Mount Hermon Conference Center. And our speaker that, that week was Presbyterian Pastor Eugene Peterson, who's the author of the message, Paraphrase. And Eugene Peterson told us pastors that each pastor has one sermon theme that they preach over and over again. In fact, he told the time that his son, Eric, who was attending his father Eugene's church, started going to another church. But then one year later, his son was back. And Eugene Peterson asked his son, what happened? Why are you back? And his son replied, that pastor did not know his one sermon. There's one message that each pastor is passionate about. And if you listen to enough of his or her sermons, you'll discover what it is. Eugene Peterson's one sermon theme was that God loves you. God's on your side. God's coming after you. He is relentless. And that's a great theme. And if I have one message that I want to give to you this morning, and I do, it's about grace. I believe with all of my heart today that everyone needs to hear and believe about God's grace. Now, what is grace? Grace is the one word that says that God is for us, that there is nothing that you can do to make God stop loving you. But many people don't believe that today. They have this distorted view of God. Instead of seeing God in some loving, graceful way, they think more of God in terms of judgment. They think that God's job description is to to keep track of why and when we don't obey all the Ten Commandments. There once was a man who who didn't keep all the Ten Commandments. This man lived a, a, a wild and a loose life. The preacher in that country church was a legalist. And when that man died, the minister insisted that the man be buried outside the fence of that country church cemetery. The minister said that the ground inside the fence was only for decent, respectable Christians. Years later, that minister was long gone, and the man's daughter came to the church to pay respect at her father's grave. But she couldn't find her father's grave outside the fence of the church cemetery. So she went over to an old caretaker, and she asked him what had happened to her father's grave. And the caretaker took the daughter to a grave that was inside the fence. And the daughter rudely said, why did you move my father's grave? And the caretaker smiled and said, we didn't move your father's grave. We moved the fence. That's another definition of grace. Moving the fence from where it rightfully belongs to where it gracefully belongs. Grace is what our Bible passage is all about this morning. We're going to look at the story of the prodigal son in depth. But before I do, I want to ask you a question. Why do you think this parable of the prodigal son means so much to so many people today? Perhaps it's because it makes us think of a family that isn't perfect. Here was a home that had flaws in it, just like many of ours. One boy breaks his father's heart by asking for his inheritance, and then he leaves home and goes far away. The other boy, what we call the elder brother, stayed at home, and somehow he never learned the true idea of love. Then have you ever noticed that there's no mention of a mother in this parable? No mention at all. Which makes us think that perhaps this was a single parent family like so many in our time. Well, let's go through the parable verse by verse. Luke 15, beginning with verse 11. Jesus said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided his property between them. Now here's a kid who just can't wait to get his inheritance, and he's entitled to a portion of his father's estate upon his father's death. But by making this request before his father had died, this young man, in essence, is saying to his father, I wish you were dead. Well, the father granted the request, and he gave the boy what he wanted. Verse 13 
Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He set out for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. This simply means that this young boy took his portion of the estate, he sold it, and he turned it into cash. You see, unlike today, the father's estate was not measured in stock portfolios or money market funds or cryptocurrency or bitcoins or or cash. But instead, wealth back in those days was measured in livestock and in land. And in the Palestinian culture, you didn't sell land that belonged to your family. Land was a part of the clan. It was part of your, your, your family's identity. But the son did it anyway. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. The young boy longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So after this youngster had wasted all of his money, he ended up working for a Gentile feeding pigs. And that's a task that any Jew would find repugnant. But then the sun sank even lower. He got so hungry, he began to eat the pig's food. And down in the trough, eating the pig's food, the sun finally hit bottom. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. And the youngster realized that he had acted very foolishly. You know, sometimes we're the same way. We believe that disobeying God's directions will allow us to have some sort of pleasures that we've been missing out on. This past year, Monica and I went through the Connections class here at the church, and we joined the church. And in that class, we received lots of helpful information in a a booklet like this about our church And in the booklet, there's this one section entitled, What We Believe. And one of the bullet points says that all who place their faith in Jesus Christ are called to a holiness of life as evidenced by obedience to God's word. And friends, I appreciate our church's emphasis on grace, but I also appreciate its emphasis on holiness. Yes, we believe strongly in grace that God loves us when we screw up. But there's also the expectation that Jesus' followers will do their best to live a life of holiness. And that's because God's way is the best way. God created us, and he knows far better what is best for us. Did you see the piece in the newspaper? It said, 11 years ago, I walked out on a 12-year marriage. My wife was a good person, but for a long time, she was under a lot of stress. Instead of helping her, I began an an adulterous affair with her best friend, and it was a disaster. And this is what I gave up. I gave up seeing my daughter grow up. I gave up the respect of many of my longtime friends, the enjoyment of living as a family, a wife who was loyal appreciative and tried very hard to make me happy and this is what I got two stepchildren who treat me like dirt a wife who didn't know how to make anything for dinner except restaurant reservations a wife whose only interest in me was how much money she could get a wife who made disparaging remarks about my family She ruined all my relationships. And finally, the best thing that I got was a bitter, expensive divorce. Sometimes, like the prodigal, we have to learn the hard way that God's way, as outlined in the Bible, is the best way. Notice what happens next. I will set out and go back to my father, he says. And I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the prodigal knew that he had messed up, and he was genuinely sorry about it. In verse 20, it says, as the younger son headed home, he was surprised because his father came running down the road to meet him. And what an incredible picture we have here of a loving father looking for his son to come back home. 
And when he saw his son, off in a distance, the Bible tells us he came running towards him. And of course, in this story, the father represents God. And friends, when we look in all of Scripture, this is the only time that we see God running. Think about it. I've always been so impressed by the faithfulness of this father. He was scanning the horizon every day for his son. You know, this father probably lost his dignity that day as he ran towards his son. No doubt the father looked very foolish before his friends and neighbors as he ran down the road with his robes flying. You don't run in a robe. Try running in your bathrobe and you'll see what I mean. One commentator said running down the road in your robe was very undignified. It would be like us running down the street in our underwear. Parents, would you run down the road in your underwear to let your child know that you love him or her? I hope so. And then notice what happens next to the son. The Bible says the father threw his arms around him and he kissed him. The father didn't stop with a kiss and a hug, but he called for a robe, a ring, and sandals. Now, if this had been my son... I would have said, let's go home. Wait until your mother sees you. She's going to be so happy. And I'm also glad that you're home. But you're grounded for the next six months. <laughs> but not this father. This father lavishly welcomed his son home. You know, there's a part of, of us that loves this story of the prodigal son. And there's another part of us that really struggles with it. Most of us have been raised where we are rewarded when we do good. And it's hard for us to believe that when we mess up, we're still going to be rewarded. Instead, we are, are wired to what we call conditional love. I'll love you if you're good. I'll love you if you do your chores. I'll love you if you make good grades on your report card. But this father practiced what we called unconditional love, a no matter what love. No matter what you've done, I love you. And that is God's amazing grace. You know, in many ways, this doesn't seem fair because most of us believe in justice and we believe in mercy, but we really don't understand grace. Do you know the difference in justice, mercy, and grace? Here's an interesting scenario that might help us understand grace. Uh, let's say you wake up one morning, you, you go outside your house to get your newspaper, and as you do, you look up the street and you see this teenager who lives down that street driving his father's car. Now, you know this boy's only 14 years old. He's not old enough to have a driver's license. And he's out of control, careening down the street. And finally, he crashes into your yard, totally destroying your mailbox and your picket fence. You run to the car. You discover that the boy is okay. And then at this point, you have three choices. Your first choice is to treat this teenager with justice. And that means that that young boy gets exactly what he deserves. You call the police, knowing that he'll get a ticket for driving without a license. You call his parents and you tell them what's happened, knowing that he's going to be grounded forever. And you force the boy to get a job to pay for your mailbox and fence. Now, exercising justice does not make you a bad person. You're simply giving that boy exactly what he deserves. You are being just. But there's another option, mercy. You decide to treat the kid with mercy. Mercy is giving someone a little bit less than he or she deserves, and you throw in a little compassion. If you were to choose the second option of mercy, you might say to the teenager, hey, I'm not going to call the police, but I am going to call your parents. We're going to sit down and we're going to agree 
upon how you're going to pay for the cost of these repairs. Now, doing this should make that teen very thankful because he's getting less than what he deserves. You are being merciful to him. But there's a third option. Instead of treating the young boy with justice or mercy, you might decide to treat this kid with grace. And here's what that would look like. You help the boy out of the car and you say something like, you messed up, young man. You destroyed my mailbox and my picket fence, but I'm not going to call the police. I'm not even sure I want to get you in a whole lot of trouble with your family. I can fix the mailbox and the fence. Why don't you and I get in my car and go find a place where we can get some breakfast and sit down and talk? And then I can find out a little bit more about what's going on in your life. There's only one condition. I get to drive. (laughs) What's your reaction to that last choice? You might be thinking, well, that's the dumbest thing I have ever heard. All that kid is going to do is go on another joyride tomorrow and plow into somebody else's mailbox. And you know, that might just happen. And that's what we call the risk of grace. But it's also possible that your graceful choice might be the turning point in this young man's life. And we need to remember that that's the way that God loves us. God doesn't love us Because we are good, God loves us because God is good. There are people sitting in this church this morning, no doubt, who think they have to earn God's love. And that's simply not true. We have worth because we are children of God. All of us have messed up at some time in our life. Maybe when you look back, you might say, well, God doesn't want anything to do with me because I have messed up. I messed up my job, or I messed up my marriage, or I messed up my family, or I messed up some relationship. The Bible is full of examples of people who have messed up. The prodigal son messed up big time. Everybody has messed up. But God doesn't write us off because we have messed up. You are valuable even if you have messed up. To really drive the point home, I want you to turn to the person beside you. And I want you to say, you are valuable because you are a child of God. Let's do that right now. You are valuable because you are a child of God. I hope you got it. I hope it sunk in. I was born in Asheville, North Carolina, and and I still have an appreciation for my southern heritage. And I love the story of the pastor who had recently moved from the west coast to, to the south. And he was in the home of one of the members of the church on a Sunday afternoon right after church. And and that happens a lot in the south. People take the preacher home for lunch. And it's so typical in Southern hospitality, the mother of that family went all out. She'd set the table with the finest linen and and, and china for the pastor. And on the table were these tall glasses of iced tea. Now, in that family, there were two young boys and there was an older sister. And the sister was making that transition into becoming a teenager. And at times, she, she felt and she acted very awkward. And that day, as the mother went into the kitchen to bring out the turkey for lunch, the sister sat down at the table. But in her teenage awkwardness, she knocked over one of the glasses of iced tea. And it made a mess all over the linen tablecloth. The father paused for a moment, and and after a moment of hesitation, wanting to spare his daughter embarrassment, the father reached over and knocked over his iced tea. The two young boys, the brothers, thought, man, this is great. And they looked at their dad, and then they knocked over their iced tea. And at this point, the pastor didn't know what to think. You know, perhaps this is some southern tradition that I've never heard of. So wanting to be the gracious guest with this grand flair, the pastor knocked over his glass of iced tea. 
At about that time, the mother arrives from the kitchen. She's carrying this big turkey, and she looks, and she can't believe what's happened to her table. You know, the linens just splashed with all this tea. It's a disaster. And as her husband takes the turkey from her, he winks at her and encourages the mom to knock over her iced tea, and she did. Fifteen years later, Fifteen years later, a young missionary woman is being interviewed. And the reporter asks her, when was the first time you experienced grace in your life? Do you remember? And that missionary woman said this, yes, I'll never forget it. It was the day my mother and father let me know that I was more important than some fancy linen tablecloths. I was more important than some silly social customs, more important than the pastor. And I knew if I mean this much to my mother and father, how much more must I mean to God? That's grace. Absolute, undeserved kindness. There's nothing that we can do to make God stop loving us. Philip Yancey, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, tells a modern, powerful story of a prodigal child. It's a story about a young girl who grows up on a farm in Traverse City, Michigan. It's a farm that has lots of cherry orchards. Her parents were a bit old-fashioned. They tend to overreact to her nose ring, the music that she listens to, the length of her skirt, and they ground her. And that night, she runs away to the big city. And there she meets a man who drives the biggest car she has ever seen. And he offers her a ride. He buys her lunch. He gives her some pills that make her feel good. She was right all along, she decides. Her parents were keeping her from having all the fun. The man in the big car teaches her a few things that men like. She lives in a penthouse. She orders room service whenever she wants. Occasionally, she thinks about her folks back home, but their lives seem so boring. But after a year, the first signs of an illness appear. And it amazes her how fast her boss turns mean before she knows that she's out on the street, sleeping on a metal grate outside a department store, and her cough just gets worse. One night as she lies awake on the grate, she no longer feels like a woman of the world. She feels like a little girl lost in a cold and frightening city. She's hungry. She needs a fix. And something jolts her memory, and this single image fills her mind. It's the month of May with a million cherry trees blooming all at once on her parents' farm. God, why did I leave, she says to herself. My dog back home has it better than I do. And she's sobbing, and she knows more than anything else in the world she wants to go home. She telephones home, and she gets the answering machine. She she leaves a message. She says, Mom, Dad, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way. It'll get there about midnight tomorrow. And if you're not there, well, I guess I'll just stay on the bus. It takes seven hours for the bus to get from that big city to this farm community. And during that time, she realizes the flaws in her plan. What if her parents were out of town and they missed the message? And even if they are home, they probably wrote her off as dead long ago. And she's thinking about the speech that she's been preparing for her dad. Dad, I'm sorry. Dad, I know I was wrong. Dad, can you forgive me? And she just keeps saying those words over and over again on the bus. And finally, the bus rolls into the station, and she smooths her hair. She looks at the tobacco stains on her fingertips, and she wonders if her parents will even notice if they're there. She walks into the terminal, 
not knowing what to expect, and nothing prepares her for what she sees. There in the shabby bus terminal stands 40 brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles and cousins, and her grandmother. And they're all wearing these goofy party hats, and they're blowing these noisemakers. And taped across the wall is a banner that says, Welcome Home. Her dad steps out of the crowd. Quivering with tears in her eyes, she begins her memorized speech. Dad, Dad, I'm so sorry. And her father interrupts her. And he says, Hush, child. We got no time for that. You'll be late for the party. A banquet is waiting for you. Welcome home. You matter to God. You're precious to God. There are people sitting in churches all over the world this morning that feel like they have to earn God's love. But the Bible teaches us in Ephesians 2.8, for it's by grace, grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one may boast. Remember this saying over and over again, there's nothing you can do to make God stop loving you. Years ago, I served a church in Jacksonville, Florida, and a very distinguished older gentleman, well-known in the community, was near the end of his life. And as the family and as this pastor gathered by his bedside, the man asked everybody to leave the room, the bedroom, except for the pastor. And then he turned to me and he said, Pastor David, I need to tell you something. And he told me the story of how when he was in his early 20s, he was serving in the United States Navy. And he told me how their ship came to shore in a foreign point, port, and he joined some of the other sailors and he did some things on shore leave that he knew was wrong. And he regretted it. And it had bothered him all these years. And he was ashamed for what he had done. And he carried that shame around with him. And he confessed it to me. And then I shared with him the words from Psalm 103 where it says, As far as the east is from the west, so great has God removed our transgressions from us. And then the words from Isaiah 118 where it says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And he understood, and he believed that his sins were forgiven. And the next day, he made his transition to heaven. But I felt a real sadness that he'd been carrying this guilt around with him all of his life. And he was only dealing with it at the very end. God wants us to live an abundant life. John 10.10, 10, it's my life verse. I came that you might have life, life in all of its abundance. Not a life that's filled with guilt and shame, but an abundant life. In just a few moments, there are going to be members of the prayer team on each side of the church who would be pleased to hear whatever your story might be, and they want to pray with you. And you might want to come to a, the prayer team with a prayer of gratitude. Thanking God for all the good things that are happening in your life right now. You might want to go to the prayer team and, and ask for a prayer for healing for you or for somebody else. Or maybe it might be a prayer of confession, wanting to clear up something that has been bothering you for a long time. And then in just a few moments, all of us are going to receive this ultimate expression of grace as we're invited to the communion table. It's through this sacrament that, that Jesus is saying that all of us are valuable to God. It's not because of our goodness. It's because of God's grace. So please, please do not go through life with guilt and with shame, missing the abundant life that can be found for us in Jesus. Remember the words of Romans 5, 8, where it says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were sinners, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Let us pray. 
Father in heaven, at times we feel so unworthy. We have messed up. And we know that we can never be good enough to earn your love. Thank you for throwing your arms around us, like, just like the father to the prodigal child. Thank you for loving us, no matter how unlovely we may feel. Thank you for moving the fence to take us back in. We're so grateful that you love us enough to have your son die on the cross for us. Thank you. Thank you. We pray in the graceful name of Jesus. Amen. Still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief for pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide in every change.
amazement, grief, and fear are gone. Sorrow for God, love's purest joy is restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past. All safe and blessed.
Well, as we go out, I'd love for you to hear the words of lamenta Lamentations, and then we'll be reminded of where our hope is found. But in Lamentations, it says, get the whole thing. I remember my afflictions and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. And this morning, we are reminded that our hope is in Christ. It's found in his blood and his saving work on the cross. And so let's thank him for that. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into
Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Go in peace.